Welcome to Trust Yourself, the podcast, the place where we learn that trust is earned and not given, even with ourselves. I'm your host, Betsy LeFay. I'm extraordinarily glad that you're here. Stick around. Welcome back, Trust Yourself listeners. I am excited to be back with you today. I've been looking forward to recording this episode for quite some time. I'm excited to share with you this phenomenal story that kind of blew my mind two weeks ago when it all came together in my head. We're going to hear about the 10 layers, as in 10 cults, that I had been in or ancillarily connected with that led me to possibly the center of one of the biggest scandals, current scandals, on the planet. Like I said, kind of blew my mind when I came across it. You're going to get to hear about what I have deemed as every heart's and what that means, what that means for you, how you can avoid them. And we're going to start off the episode today talking about what happens when you speak out and why it's important. So I've shared a little bit about this on, you know, these episodes where I'm sharing my story about why I'm sharing my story, how it frees my voice, how it acts as a roadmap for you to see what to avoid and how to not fall into the same fates. And what's interesting is, let's just take Scientology as an example. I I go back to Scientology because... um, I've never been exposed to it on a personal level, but there's so much information out there and they share how every narcissist works. They share how every cult works. They share what happens when you speak out and what the repercussions are. And it's full of bold individuals who continue to speak out despite one of them had 19 lawsuits put against them, and she was a survivor of the Holocaust. So I don't even think she was a member of Scientology. She just decided to, she was a reporter, and she decided to report on the abuses, and Scientology went after her for decades, almost put her in jail, framed her for a bomb threat that she actually never had anything to do with, and that was proven with documents in a court of law. Recently, I put out a Instagram slash TikTok video that says uh, the 10 reasons I had a veritable conga line of abusers. I made this video to sort of get the word out of the podcast of uh, red flags and friendships. And of course, the 10 reasons why I attracted all of these abusers. I put it out on TikTok and we have the lovely Diplo San Juan who put a comment on there. I don't know if the comment's been taken down or not. Um, I reported it. Sometimes I can see it. Sometimes I can't. But Diplo San Juan, we get to thank you because he brings up a very good point. Here's what Diplo San Juan on TikTok said in response to the 10 reasons I had a veritable conga line of abusers. The loudest ones are the biggest abusers, she who talks loud. Say nothing. I see through you. You're as wicked as they come. So what is so important about this comment is that um, he's sort of um, conflating two different ideas. He's conflating the idea that if you are intelligent, you don't need to tell people you're intelligent. You can show that you're intelligent. That's true. You don't need to run around and tell everyone, I'm a genius. I have a high IQ. You can, if you're confident, you just need to be yourself and people will understand that if it matters. He's, com- he's conflating that idea with the idea that if you've been wronged in the past and you speak up about it, that you are actually an abuser. Okay, so he's conflating the idea that if you go around town telling everyone and all of your new friends, I have the highest IQ, I'm a genius, I have the highest IQ, I've been tested since I was young, I'm an idiot savant, that that person is actually usually a narcissist. They are usually covering up some kind of insecurity and that they're in some ways lying and trying to pull the wool over your eyes, trying to manipulate you. Um, And as Diplo might say, Diplo San Juan might say, they're wicked. 
Some people would say they're soulless. I would say that they are not connected to their soul. That's why the narcissists come after empaths, because empaths are connected to their soul. Narcissists do have a soul, they just will never be connected to the soul, so they're jealous and they're insecure. So he's conflating these two ideas together that are actually separate. So it is true that if you're smart or you're empathic, that's something that narcissists will do. They will say, I have so much empathy, I am empathic, I am just like you. Well, you know, when empaths get together, we might ask each other, like, are you an empath or are you empathic? That's true, but we don't go around talking to people and saying, I'm an empath, I'm an empath, I'm so empathic. If you need to prove that you're empathic as a narcissist, which you're not, you're going to go around and a lot of times you're going to cut someone off at the pass. You're going to, before they even think that you're not empathic, they're going to tell you that they are. It's one of the lies that they put out there. So I put out this educational video to promote an educational podcast that goes into uh, deeper details about why each of these is a risk factor, right? Um, so in the text I say, it turns out it was one of the easiest targets imaginable. Let me know in the comments how many of the reasons you have. Are you an empath? Are you an entrepreneur? And I, if you want to know more about like, why are entrepreneurs more of a target for narcissists, just go back and listen to the Red Flags and Friendship Plus the 10 Reasons uh, podcast, which was like four podcasts ago or something. Easy to find. So again, he says, the loudest ones are the biggest abusers. In some ways, yes. But if you're hurt and you're loud, that means you're a victim slash survivor. She who talks loud, meaning I'm talking loud, and he tells me, say nothing. He's effectively saying, you should be silent. I am trying to silence you. Then he says, I see through you. You're as wicked as they come. Well, first of all, I have to say, you know you're doing something right if you're pissing someone off. That's a lesson that a lot of us have to learn the hard way. I know I did. And what's interesting about this conflation, these, these uh, unhealthy putting two of these concepts, these two different concepts, both true together, is that if every victim, if every survivor, again, same thing, if everyone who was abused, who was wrong, who was hurt, stayed silent, said nothing, who benefits from that? The abusers. And that's why I started off saying in this podcast, this is what motivated me. It's not just the Scientology documentaries. You've heard me talk about all the other ones, Tinder Swindler and all these ones where people are saying, oh my gosh, I was so naive. I kept giving $10,000, $30,000, And I feel duped. I feel a little stupid, but I'm wiser for it. And why are they coming on camera to say that? It's not because they're as wicked. It's because they want to tell their story for their own healing, to take their own voice back. And also, it's a warning. It's a warning. So thank you, Diplo San Juan, for letting me know that I'm doing a good job by getting pissed off and um, you felt the need to put that comment on there. Um, I don't really have any feelings towards Diplo San Juan except for gratitude, so I could comment on this. Um, and I, I don't know what his point is. Um, perhaps he's an abuser. I don't know. Um, perhaps he's as wicked as they come. I don't know anyone who, who talks like that. You're as wicked as they come. Um, but if he thinks I'm wicked, then maybe he should just stay away. <laughs> That's fine with me. So let's get on to this story of the 10 layers of cults really, really well. So we'll start from the beginning real quick. Um, most of you know at this point I was raised Catholic, which is a cult. And I'll explain a little bit about this. So many organized religions, though not all, um, but specifically the Catholic cult is a cult that requires its parishioners, its participants, its followers to blindly follow the leader. We know now that there has been numerous, you can't even count how many um, sexual assaults, rapes, horrific situations of children and adults 
um, that have come to the courts in the recent years, but they've been going on since the beginning. There was a guy um, in the 70s who decided to make this a um, study, and he studied priests who are take a vow of celibacy, and he found out that at any given time, this is back in the 70s, it's only gotten worse, only 50% of the priests were celibate, and that the church had a rule that as long as it was not out in the open, as long as it was secret, it was okay. Not only that, but something that the Catholic Church does, which to me just creeps me out, Ooh, and I definitely had to go through this, is they have confession. You're supposed to go to confession on a regular basis. And in cult language, that's what's called collateral. So if you look at the Nexium cult, if you look at the Scientology cult, if you look at other cults, you'll see that there's uh, etching away at your own ability to think for yourself brainwashing, but oftentimes there's what's called collateral. So they will ask you for the things that you're ashamed of, the things that you perceive that you did wrong, the things that you're embarrassed about, the things that you would never want anyone, let alone the public, to know, the things that you're shameful of, which they teach you to be shameful of, by the way. And so then you're going to think twice before leaving. For instance, Scientology has a whole notebook of everything that you have said you've done. Even if you haven't done it, you've just said it because you were coerced to say it. And so it's been proposed, there's many other reasons, but it's been proposed that a lot of celebrities, including most recently um, Miss Presley, I forget her name, um, it's been said that she won't leave or pu be publicly against Scientology because she's afraid that Scientology has dirt on her that would, um, if it were to come out in the public, it would affect her um, parenting rights. And so that's what the Catholic Church does. And it's always been weird to me that an unmarried priest who supposedly has never had sex which we know is a, is a complete lie. So somebody who's lying and the, the um, institution that supports those lies is you're demanded to tell them your deepest, darkest secrets. That is a huge red flag. So I was taught to follow the leader blindly, right? Do what they say, even if it doesn't feel good. And same thing with being raised by a covert narcissist. At every turn, when I felt something was right, I had it, in as a metaphor, slapped down. I wasn't actually physically slapped. I was poisoned when I um, would be feeling joy with my friends. It would immediately be stopped. That friend would be sent home, and I would be put on more medication. So I have that sort of background. I had just left... Uh, what some deem a cult of two in a marriage. So when you're in a relationship with a narcissist or a covert narcissist, they call it a cult of two. Why do they call it a cult of two? Because narcissists, well, all cults are run by narcissists. And uh, when you're in a relationship, it doesn't just have to be romantic. This could be boss. This could be a business partnership. This could even be a controlling neighbor, friend. Um, but when you're in a relationship with a narcissist or covert narcissist, they rule the same way that the cults do. So they, they deem it a cult of two. So I, had, um, I wasn't actually even divorced yet. I was separated um, from that cult of two. So I escaped to California. And in California, I start to get breathwork training. And this was actually called out for cult-like behavior. I actually haven't heard anyone refer to it as a cult. As we learn um, with Asia Ophelia in that podcast, last week's podcast, it's kind of like anything could be called a cult at this time. As she points out, she's like, I really like making cheese. Um, and I'm involved with other cheesemakers. You could consider that a cult. Well, in loose terms, yes, but cults have um, very explicit, although usually covert, ways of controlling the people in them um, and brainwashing them. So um, that's sort of a loose interpretation with the cheese, but um, I'm not using that in this case. Um, so in the breathwork community that I immediately got involved in, um, something that I was like, really surprised when I was looking back. Um, they told us that we were healers, and at this point I had already been on the top 10 list of psychic mediums and full-time self-employed for close to a decade, and they brainwashed me to say, no, I'm not a psychic, I'm a healer. 
and I actually gave up readings for a year. Meanwhile, I look back on it, and the trainer, who is not the leader of this cult, um, was just one of their favorites and was deemed uh, one of the other white people that could do this training for no apparent reason. Um, it turns out that he was a tarot reader. So um, I haven't used tarot in my readings, but they function similarly, uh, reading the energy of the situation and possibly projecting that out into the future. And I didn't find that out until several years later that he's using tarot, but yet he's the one who encouraged me and said, you know, no, you're, you're not a psychic, you're a healer. So uh, in this breathwork cult, um, they got called out for cultural appropriation, which I have witnessed. Um, not being trauma-informed, uh, I experienced mans mansplaining. Um, I experienced minimization of mine and other people's concerns with the practice. Uh, there was a sort of changing story of the origins of this breathwork, which the leader later clarified um, in sort of a contemptful way, and contempt and narcissism are very, very closely linked. Um, or rather, narcissists hold contempt quite a lot. Um, there was no clear way to, quote-unquote, move up in the group, and there was only an insular, quote-unquote, in-group uh, as far as who were the other trainers that were trained. And people... You know, you just had to keep showing up and hope that you were liked and just get on the in crowd. These are all things that this breath group, uh, group was called out for. Um, one of the biggest red flags, and um, this happened before I joined, but I, I heard after I joined, and this is quite common in cults, the cult leader will get divorced, and then if the cult leader is a straight man, let's say, uh, usually is, but not always, um, We'll talk about a, a non a white woman who was a cult leader in a little bit that I was ancillarily involved in. Um, but this, you know, this happened in this group uh, where the man got divorced and then plucked a sexual partner from an actual breathwork healing session. It was a one on one session. I don't know what happened in that session, but they wound up dating after that. Uh, they broke up, and he wound up doing the same thing with another woman, um, more than a decade younger, close to two, I believe, decades younger than him. And um, it was after that first woman, when they broke up, that a lot of the people wound up leaving that breathwork community because they kind of saw through. They said, oh my gosh, in some way, I'm kind of speaking on their behalf, conjecturing, but I did hear um, from some people who stayed and what happened where... You think about it, you're in this really, really intimate, high energy, subtle space with a uh, older, more knowledgeable man, um, very, very vulnerable. I mean, you're breathing in your belly, breathing into your heart, and exhaling. A lot of times women will take off their bra for that for you know, obvious reasons. You're expanding. You don't want to have that constriction around you. Um, there's definitely healing touch involves, healing, you know, touching your heart space, which is right in between your breasts. So you're doing this stuff and maybe you go to him for a one-on-one -on -one session. Well, you don't know if that's going to get sexual or not. Um, I haven't heard of anything other than that before or after, but he wound up marrying this woman who's, again, this is just an estimate, uh, two decades younger than him. Um, maybe it's a little less than that. And what's interesting is when I was on retreat and the, his family was present, so uh, his child and his uh, new young wife were present, um, the wife in, in a group setting where we're doing healing work together, we're talking, um, she would say things like, you know, he's old enough to be my dad, but we make sure that it's not a child-father dynamic. I would, I would kind of put that in the category that um, Diplo San Juan was conflating of like, if you really don't, if you really don't have a child father dynamic with him, you don't need to say it. We will experience that. And it's definitely not appropriate if you are the leader's wife to be sharing that stuff. But meanwhile, I witnessed over and over again, um, 
this woman acting literally like an impetulant child in front of the retreat participants. She would come in and have a little tantrum um, that she wasn't alerted of something. She would complain about him and how she wasn't getting enough attention. Um, so that kind of goes into that first concept that we talked about. If you're not seeing him as a father figure and you feel like you're equal, which there's no way that they could have been equal with two decades more experience on his side. There's a power in difference there, which is why a lot of the people left. Um, then you wouldn't be displaying these other behaviors. You wouldn't be having a temper tantrum. You wouldn't be shit-talking the leader in front of all the other participants. You wouldn't be complaining or looking for support from them about your issues. So I was involved in that. Um, these other ones I had sort of an ancillary sort of uh, connection to. Well, one of these breathwork um fellow healers, classmate of mine, she invited me to a cacao ceremony. And what's cool is I have a friend in California who has very strong opinions about cacao ceremonies. So I, I believe that they're very powerful. Cacao is a wonderful spiritual medicine. It's a heart opener. And it does have a very specific ceremony around it. However, it may seem as though it's not as powerful or dangerous as something like ayahuasca, for instance. It is still whitewashed in the same way as in, I went to five ceremonies in Brooklyn with a quote-unquote shaman, and now I'm going to lead my own ayahuasca ceremonies from my living room. Definitely a very, very, very unwise idea. They wind up calling themselves shamans. They wind up calling themselves gurus. Um, and, you know, it's not like the uh, college system or doctorate system we have here in the United States where, you know, you go to accredited schools, you get a degree, you take certain, you know, uh, requirements. This is something that um, people are fragmenting and then, acting as if they have the knowledge, the experience, the maturity, um, just really the solidness behind this and a practice. And um, to me, it's, it's like um, going on a long distance road trip with someone who's had their permit for a month and says, I took two driving lessons. It's extraordinarily dangerous. And um, cacao ceremonies are a lot like that. So this breathwork participant brings me to a cacao ceremony and it was a powerful experience for sure and it's there at that ceremony that i meet s oh i'm just calling s um and s turns out to be the fella who i already spoke about on the i was taken for a hundred thousand dollars and gaslit by a spiritual coach um s at this time when i meet him is actually that coach's uh, ex-boyfriend at the time, and now they're married. And I was that in-between sort of appetizer that pushed him over the edge to say, um, oh, you know what, I actually want to go back with my ex-girlfriend. So I meet S at this cacao ceremony, and as I shared in a more detailed way in that episode, um, we have an intense time and I get quickly discarded. Um, and... At the same time, I had met a different fella um, who we'll call Sun. Um, so I met Sun, who had so many striking similar similarities to S. I met them within a few couple of weeks, and they really confused me. So here's where we get to the uh, every heart. So it really confused me. Now, if you have not been to California, if you don't live in California, um, the chances of you experiencing this are lower they're not zero, but this is, every hearts are rampant in California. Um, I've seen one or two, I've encountered one or two on the East Coast in New York, um, but they're definitely more prevalent in traveling communities, at retreat centers, at, um, even if you just go to like a hour work, excuse me, an hour like spiritual workshop, you'll likely encounter um, every hearts. I have not encountered any women every hearts. So I encounter S and Sun, and they both do the same thing, which I hadn't experienced before, but have a lot since, where 
your initial meeting with them just like gives me the creeps even talking about it now. You're, you, you meet them the very first time. Um, chances are you're a woman meeting them. Let's make it really heteronormative here. So you're a woman, single woman, who maybe uh, doesn't feel seen, maybe is not in her power, maybe is just an empath and really open, um, maybe just likes to connect authentically, maybe is lonely, maybe is single, and you come across an every heart like S or Sun, and they look you deep in the eyes, and they have this smooth voice, and they say some spiritual platitude of it's all within you, or it's all love, good vibes here, some other spiritual platitude, and you're like, oh my gosh, straight guy, that's exactly what I want to hear, and then they actually go to give you a hug. And when they give you a hug, they wrap their loving arms around you and they take a deep breath and they go, <sighs> and you just open your heart right up. It's definitely manipulation happening. I can't say as far as it's narcissistic, um, although there's those are some tactics that a narcissist might use. Um, I'm not conflating this with narcissism, although they might be related. So what happens to a lot of women, not every woman, but what happens to a lot of women on that receiving end is, you know, all the flood of neurochemicals is like a form of love bombing, basically. You've wanted this acknowledgement. You wanted to be seen by a man and felt like a man, by a man like this, maybe your whole life. You feel seen, you feel heard, you feel felt. And then what happens is a lot of times you get googly eyed for this person. You wind up having a crush on them. You're like, oh, we have a special connection. So I get discarded by S and then Sun is very confusing, confusing, and then I wind up running into him a few times, and I see him do this with woman after woman after woman, right in front of my eyes. I'm not talking about, like, weeks. I'm talking about three women in a row, you know, and within half an hour or less. So I say to myself, okay, what's the common denominator? Um, I've seen this with two people. S wound up getting back with his ex. So he's sort of like seeing both of us at the same time. Um, it seems like Sun is, is seeing every woman and I'm not used to this. So I, when I have something that I can't figure out immediately, I like to take a retreat into nature. I like to rent a house or a cabin or go camping. Um, if I can't do that, then a, a day trip, but usually sort of an overnight trip. And honestly, up on a mountain is better, but um, that's not one of the requirements. Or by water, or both. So even though it's discarded by S, there was just a sort of trickling of communication afterwards. Um, not that much. And um, I didn't tell him what I was trying to figure out, but I said, you know, I have something I need to figure out. I'm looking for this a retreat. You know, I'm not talking about a spiritual retreat that you go on that's a program. I'm looking for myself to go by myself to retreat out of my regular life so that I can spend some deep thinking, feeling time and connect to myself and figure this out. So S says to me, hey, um, you know those that couple who's this, who's uh, our sound healers, um, you know, they have a house that they just bought in the mountains outside of L.A. And um, you should connect with them. Now, it's interesting because meanwhile, while this is all going on, I was actually trying to befriend these two people. And I think that they had a lot of exposure. They were working at this uh, yoga, metaphysical center, culture, uh, crystals um, shop. And they had, uh, you know, this like weekly gig. And so they were very exposed and very well known. Um, I was trying to befriend them because I really liked them. Um, and I was like, oh, these are, these are my people. It turns out we had a lot in common, especially like growing up in the East Coast and being in Brooklyn at the same time. 
Um, so also what was going on here in the meanwhile is um, I have a lot of friends, not myself, I'm actually relatively proud to say, a lot of friends who are deeply embedded in the OM community, the orgasmic community, the orgasmic meditation community, um, otherwise known as One Taste, run by Nicole Daydon. There's a female cult leader right there, and we're going to talk about another female cult leader in just a second. Um, that was wildly covered as a cult, um, and so much of those practices just really, I'm going to say rubbed me the wrong way, which is a terrible pun that I did not intend to make, but um, if you look into what orgasmic meditation is, you'll see why rubbing the wrong way is funny. I'm not going to explicitly say it here. Um, but they were doing uh, sexual practices that um, they were saying were not sex. And uh, just a whole bunch of other stuff I won't get into, but wildly abusive, wildly manipulative, wildly brainwashing. Another situation where everyone decides to live together. Um, and living together is not necessarily a bad idea. Living together in a cult. Yeah, that's like the compl the compilation. Oh, what is it? Completion, right? It's like you can have a group house. You can have a cult. It doesn't mean that if you're in a cult, you're living with a group. And it doesn't mean that if you're living with a group, you're in a cult. But a lot of times, when you run a cult, you wind up living communally. Okay? So watch out for that. Um, also, another um, female cult leader that I was ancillarily involved with, I actually wound up running into her a few times in LA, um, and that is uh, Katie Griggs, otherwise known as Guru Jagat. And she, I, I didn't even know this, she, she died just uh, under a year ago now. Um, and I witnessed firsthand um, her abuse and I, um, I was trying to get classes taught in her yoga studios, Rama Yoga Studios. I wound up actually teaching out of there a few times. Not Kundalini, but the breath work. Um, the breath work practice is wonderful. The cult, not so much. Um, then also that yoga center crystal shop where the sound healers were working out of was also not a cult, but the owner was a well-known sexual predator. And I heard a little less than a handful of first-hand accounts of the, uh, of him acting completely inappropriately, touching, grabbing, proposing, manipulating. Um, and I also saw and witnessed him first time abusing and manipulating his employees repeatedly. Um, and so I actually wound up teaching out of there too. Great. We're, we're seeing lots and lots of layers here. Um, and that's where the sound healers were working out of. I didn't really obviously realize that any of these things were cults at the time. So when S says to me, um, those sound healers have a house outside of LA in the mountains, and he hooks me up with them, you know, sends me their um, phone number, I'm like, great, here's my retreat. I get to figure out, this is before I came up with Every Hearts, the, the idea of Every Hearts, why did I attract Sun and S at the same time? There's, there's got to be a reason. So I contact the sound healers. They're like, yep, we just bought a house. Yes, you can rent it. So I think I rented it for three or four nights. I only wound up staying for two. Um, I go up there, and it's amazing. I love that place so much. I wound up spending a relatively a good amount of time there while I lived in L.A., became close with the sound healers. Um, and, you know, we started off the podcast talking about Scientology. Well, at this point, I had no knowledge of Scientology. Didn't know what it was. Didn't know that Tom Cruise and John Travolta were big stars in Scientology. Didn't know about the abuse. Really knew nothing about it. it was, I was completely blind to it. Didn't know what it was. So I go up to this mountain house and I believe I like stay overnight there. And then the next day, I think I go to like the supermarket um, to get some food. And on my way back, I take a wrong turn. And this is where my mind just was like getting blown two weeks ago. Just like, I can't even believe I didn't, I can't even believe this. It's so wild. Um, let me, let me just, um, let me just back up and say, um, there's so much that is horrific about Scientology. 
but it can kind of be broken down into three major topic scandals or abuse accusations. Um, one is that they're tax exempt and so they have so much money and the way that they get around, you know, the, the way that they get to keep that money is buying property. And so they just keep up buying property, buying property, and it's all these empty buildings. That's, that's probably one of the most major ones. Second one is the actual abuse of people and what's called fair game. So while you're in Scientology, the physical, mental, and spiritual abuse that you receive, which is horrific, but then also when you leave, they spend tons of money hiring private investigators, and it's literally written in their documents to find three ways to harass the person until they're ruined, until they're taken out. Um, they have no nothing left to give and you've ruined their lives or until they're dead. So that's the Scientology policy. And the third one, which is a huge scandal, huge mystery, is, um, you know, it was it was founded by L. Ron Hubbard. When L. Ron Hubbard died, uh, David Miscavige took over, and he was married to, or is married to, Shelley Miscavige. And about 15 years ago now, Shelley Miscavige mysteriously disappeared. No one has heard from her since. Anytime someone tries to ask about her, they are punished severely uh, with all the ways that we just talked about. You're not even allowed to ask the whereabouts of Shelly Miscavige. You can't ask about her, where she is, what happened to her. And to be honest, there isn't a person on the planet besides maybe David Miscavige and the people who are involved in this who know if she's actually dead or alive, who know if she's being held against her will or if she's brainwashed to thinking she should be held there. But the people who know enough about Scientology, and there's a lot out there, they say that if she is alive, then there's only one place that she could be. She's never been seen in 15 years. And that is in this super, super, super hidden compound that even the most devout Scientologists don't know exists. It's a place, I mean, if you think about it, if you're this really, really powerful entity, cult slash religion, um, and you have so much money, you can find a place to hide someone and you're going to do it so that it's really, really hard to find them, right? Um, you're going to keep a secret and it's going to be really hard to get to. So here I am up in the mountains on my own retreat. Side note, I figured out what, um, why I was attracting these people. It's because I had left the door open with an ex of mine. So although I said I was a, um, monogamist, only one partner. Um, I left the door open to be polyamorous. I don't have any judgment against it. Um, it just, I was not in alignment. I was saying one thing, but actually doing another passively, although it was an energy that I was putting out there of non-monogamy, even though I was talking about non-monogamy. So then I wound up with um, S, who was sort of courting both me and his ex at the same time. I wound up with Sun, who was the every heart, doing that with everybody. And um, that's why I only spent two nights at that um, house in the mountains, is because I figured it out. As soon as I figured it out, um, I called up that ex and I said, hey, by the way, you know, you are welcome to stay at my house if you come through California in a month, but we will not be having sex. Um, he's a narcissist, so of course he said, well, of course, I didn't think we would, um, but I didn't placate to that. Um, and I kept to my word. Uh, I was like, you know, that's, I just cut that off. I shut that door so that I would um, then be the person that I wanted to attract. I was not being in every heart, okay? So I go to the grocery store and I take that wrong turn. I go and it's gorgeous up there. This is near Lake Arrowhead um, outside of LA. It is absolutely gorgeous near Twin Peaks. Um, huge, huge pine trees and um, just the weather is gorgeous. It's the sunny mountains of California, the gorgeous winding roads. The houses are so cute. And on this wrong turn, um, which I still couldn't tell you how I got there. This is almost like one of those fairy tales where like you get lost in the woods and you come back and you're like, there's a monster or, or there's a jewel in the woods and you come back and tell the, the townspeople and then you go back to the woods and like you can't find your way again because it like disappeared. This is authentically how it feels. I could not tell you how to get back there. So I take this wrong turn and um, 
I come across this, like, this, I'll call it a compound, but that brings up a different image in my head. It was just these cool houses, really, on both sides of the street. But there was the most intense fences I have ever seen in my life. And these fences had these, like, 12 to 14-inch spikes at, like, 45-degree angles on both sides of the fence. So you think of razor wire. This is, like... This is like middle ages around a moat, you know, razor wire. It's something I've never seen before. So it's protecting, it's clearly protecting from the outside. And then it's also protecting from the inside. In other words, if you were from the outside and you wanted to get in, nope. If you were on the inside and wanted to get out, nope. So uh, not everyone would have the same reaction and... Um, I think I'm a little bit more safe these days, but I am a little bit curious sometimes, you know, I'll wander into the woods and check things out, and um, luckily my intuition has, has served me well in that, and it's only gotten stronger through my healing. So as I'm seeing this, my, instead of the fences turning me away, you know, um, just with their look, which is what they're meant to do, they're meant to be intimidating, saying like, get out of here, um, it actually piqued my interest, right, because I'm just like, whoa, what is it they want to protect in there? Like, this is the most intense thing. Like, what is this? And the girls manager's like, oh my gosh, like, what is this? So I slow my roll. I'm in the car and I kind of slow down and I'm like clearly like Googling out the windows to both sides. And it's not even within 30 seconds of me uh, slowing down my door, slowing down my car, that from both sides of the road, armed guards come out. And I'm like, whoa. I don't know what this place is. It's kind of like um, if you're in the woods and you like saw a bear, um, you might be like, oh, okay, didn't mean to disturb you. I'm going to slowly back away. I'm no harm. And just give me a minute to turn around and I'm just going to go back the way I came. All right. Okay. See you later. And that's what I did. I did this like three pointer, just like smooth slow. Um, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm just going to get out of here. So fast forward to where last, you know, a year ago this time, um, before I found out about the abuse and the mental illness in my family, I was guided to start watching the three seasons of the Scientology documentary. And in that series, they try, they have a whole episode about where's Shelly? Where's Shelly Miscavige? Is she alive? Why can't we speak to her? Where is she? Where is she? And don't you know, they go to where they think she is. And where do they roll up? This exact place that I literally stumbled upon. I don't know a single soul personally who's ever been there who's ever stumbled upon it, who's ever tried to go there, who's ever wanted to go there. It's obviously not, obviously not a place where you want to go because they take pictures of your license plate and if you make any peep, they're, you're going to be fair gamed. You're going you're gonna to have, uh, they're going to make your life a living hell. So I watched, the, I watched it the first time and I'm like, oh, I've been there. That's interesting. So then, again, a year later, just like two months ago, my intuition prompts me to watch the whole series again, and I got a lot of healing out of it. There were things um, that I didn't know in my own past were abuse, and I found out were abusive. Um, it was very healing to hear Leah say over and over again, but you are just a child, because um, I do have a therapist who um, helps to... Um, witness and normalize uh, things like this with my healing, but to hear that over and over and over again after 41 years of hearing the opposite is very healing. So when I'm watching it the second time and it comes up to the episode of Where's Shelly and they roll up to this place again, instead of me saying like, oh, I've been there, all of a sudden I'm like, oh my goodness, I've been there. Not only have I been there, but I stumbled upon it. And I don't know anyone who stumbled. It's not, it's a place where you're, it's supposed to be impossible to stumble upon, you realize. Like, that's the last thing they want. You know, it's just like, 
there are people who are being tortured. There are people who have gone missing. There are people who are being held against their will. But I would argue none are as well known and as sought after as Shelley Miscavige. This is the modern day literal example of Rapunzel being Rapunzel locked away possibly 10, 20 feet from the road, not even being able to see the light of day. The reason why they have isolated her is because out of all of the tragedies and travesties and abuse and trauma that the, the Church of Scientology has committed, and the leader, David Miscavige, being the most violent and the most unlawful and unjust and horrific dictator, she has seen the most. So it's argued that there haven't been there hasn't been enough evidence to prove in a court of law that David Miscavige should go to jail. Well, we're pretty certain that Shelley would have that. So to prevent that, they have had to lock her away where no one would ever find her. So it blows my mind because, as you can see, I take a lot of responsibility for my life. If I see a repeating pattern in my life that I don't like and I can't figure it out through therapy, through meditation, I will take time out of my life to contemplate it, to allow... God, source, the universe, whatever it is you want to call it, to come to me and show me what I can't see. And I had gone to do this. It's not until now that I realized I was 10 layers deep into cults. And I literally take a wrong turn and stumble upon where real life Rapunzel is guarded with firearms, never to be seen again. This story makes me so proud of how far I've come. I've said it before, I'll say it again, um, I'm not infallible. You know, I've, I've made mistakes. I will continue to make mistakes. That's something that cult leaders never do. They never take responsibility. They've never made mistakes. They're infallible. They're all-knowing. You trust them above all. You know, my, my class, Trust Yourself Intuition School, my school is all about trusting yourself. I tell people, it's not trust the Betsy Le Fay course. And I literally set up in advance and tell people and then later celebrate when and if a student or a coaching client disagrees with me. That is showing that they've overcome codependence. That is showing that they feel comfortable to bring something up to me. That is showing that I've created an environment which says conflict is healthy. We can agree to disagree. I am, Betsy Le Fay is not an expert on you. You are the expert on you. And that is what I'm teaching you. No one is the expert on you. No one can treat you badly. No one, no one deserves to treat you badly. So, I don't feel like I'll be involved in any more cults, to be honest. Um, and I feel so much more empowered to prevent any involvement in any more cult of two relationships. And I continue to uh, stay in therapy to to help me with that in case um, in case I do get duped again because th that's where I'm not infallible. Like I feel pretty confident. My therapist feels pretty confident in me. My friends feel pretty confident. They're not worried that I'm gonna get into another abusive partnership, relationship, business relationship, whatever. They're they're everywhere. Um, but I continue to learn. So 
that is what I have to share today. All of these cults. Maybe hearing about all these cults, the Catholic cults, the Rama cults, um, the narcissist cults, the breathwork cults, whatever, maybe this has sort of turned your ears and eyes open to maybe the things going on in one of the communities you're in. Maybe not. My very, you know, bottom line hope is that this proves as education for you, that you'll be able to spot some of these signs, whether they be in a cult of two or in a Christian cult or um, anything like that. But I also want to end where we finished. Or, yes, <laughs> end where we started with Diplo San Juan. The loudest ones are not the biggest abusers. Not always. In fact, when victims try to speak out, they're shamed, they're blamed, they're gaslit by the biggest abusers. When victims and survivors keep silent, the people who have the power are the abusers. Now, I'll give you one out final sort of uh, piece that's vitally important when, on this topic is, um, in general, and you can find a lot of YouTube sources by people who are experts in narcissism, Dr. Romney being one of them, um, it's not wise to alert flying monkeys. It's not wise to get discarded by a narcissist in a romantic relationship and then tell the new girlfriend or boyfriend that, hey, watch out, that person's a narcissist. Um, that's a, an instance where I'm going to say the only thing that will work, there are exceptions to the rule, but by and large, the only thing that will work is you taking care of you and you healing. That's not where you're, you're on your trail of life and you, and you yell behind you, watch out, narcissist's coming. That, that doesn't work. But when you come to a place of healing then you can start to share. When you've been wronged, you can bring it up in a court of law. You can write a book about your healing. You can make a podcast. You can make a TikTok. And that will lead people not connected directly to your situation so that they can come to their own situ their, their own conclusions. And to be very clear, you're not. I'm not making these resources and I would not encourage you to so that the narcissist sees them or that the narcissist's new girlfriend sees them. That energetically is still keeping you connected to the abuse. And just like we saw with the every hearts, what you put out there does come back. It's not like you're deserving of abuse. But that's why I say only you can stop narcissism. It's not stopping the narcissist from abusing other people. It's you getting away from the narcissists. Not putting up with it. Not being an enabler. Because that's unfortunately when you do speak out in that. So this is Diplo San Juan. I don't know who that is. Blocked him. Whatever. Who cares? I, you know, I'll have trolls wherever I am and I celebrate them. But this is not somebody who I know directly. This is not a flying monkey. This is not a relative. This is not a fellow breathwork practitioner saying, you're just trying to take our teacher down. You know, I, I don't think any of the people, I don't think flying monkeys, I don't think um, breathwork people are seeing this. And... Um, I don't think my family's seeing or listening to this. If they did, fine, but that's not the purpose. But um, they're not listening. This is for you, and this is for the people that you know, so that you can stay safe proactively, you can get out of the dangerous situations that you're in, and you can protect yourself in the future. And until next time, may your intuition be with you. Take care, everyone. This episode of Trust Yourself, the podcast, is created, written, and produced by me, your host, Betsy Le Fay. Music provided by the amazing and generous Ben Talmy. Thanks, Ben. If you'd like to find out more about me and my work, and specifically how you can trust your intuition, 
head over to BetsyLeFay.com. Thanks again for being here. See you next time. Oh yeah, and if you like the show, please subscribe and give us a review. It's one of the best ways to help us get the word out to other people like you. Of course, if you know anyone else that would find this podcast helpful, pass it along to them. Sharing is caring.